with approximately 139,000 people on the local authority waiting lists as of February this year, there must be a significant increase in capital funding for local authorities to deliver an acquisition and new build programme over the next five years to meet this increase in demand as our population increases. And I suppose to that end, Chairman, already we're over a year into the strategy announced in 2015 and very little has been achieved, I suppose, as in some ways due to the fact that enough projects hasn't been shovel ready to commence. During the course of the last decade and under various governments, national policy has been over-reliant on the private sector housing market to deliver social housing units. We believe that now is the time for the trend to be reversed. The number of new build and acquisitions of local authority social housing units has fallen from 31,527 units delivered in the six-year period from 2004 to 2009 to just 5,702 units delivered in the following six-year period from 2010 to 15. This significant drop in local authority new build and acquisition units was partially compensated through the delivery of 32,000 privately provided housing units during the same six-year period to 2015. These units were delivered through a number, of, uh, a number of social housing supports in the private housing sector, including RAS, HAP and the SHCEP scheme, previously known as long-term leasing. Such figures demonstrate considerable over-reliance on the private housing market to deliver social housing units. However, with population growth figures set to continue to rise, thus enforcing the, a high demand for housing, this will inevitably lead to, to both social housing and private housing clients competing for the same limited supply of units in the absence of a significant increase in the building of social housing units. While we believe that local authorities in their role as housing authorities have an important function in facilitating housing provision and development in conjunction with the private sector and the approved housing bodies, it is imperative that the local government be allowed the freedom to substantially enhance its own capacity to, to directly deliver on housing units, a belief we strongly hold. Under the current Social Housing Strategy 2020, it is proposed that 110,000 social un housing units are to be delivered in the period of 15 to 2020. However, of these 110,000 units, only 35,000 are to be delivered through new build and acquisitions, with the remaining 75,000 to be delivered through the existing RAS and HAP schemes via, via the private housing market. We, we also believe in this regard that we are overly reliant on the HAP scheme and we believe that in many parts of the country the HAP scheme is probably at saturation point because the units are just physically not there. The association sees as a continuation of the existing over-reliance on the private housing market and therefore we envision in the absence of a significant investment in new unit development by the local authorities, continued, continued inability to meet housing demand throughout the state. We therefore call for the figures as set out in the social housing strategy to be revised to a more evenly 50-50 split for the delivery of these units between new bills, acquisitions and units delivered under the RAS and HAP scheme. We believe this is even ambitious on that split basis. As stated in our opening comments, local authorities have a strong record of achievement in, this, in the housing area and are always conscious of the need to create sustainable integrated communities with accessibility to schools, community facilities, shopping centres and indeed employment. A national local authority house building programme will ensure that these sustainable communities will continue into the future. In that regard, we counsel caution in responding to calls for NAMA housing to be handed over in bulk to local authorities. In addition, as we noted earlier, we have a responsibility towards sustaining communities and simply accepting units offered through NAMA would do with without due regard for the need of community sustainability could conceivably end up creating even more legacy challenges for their relevant housing authorities. And can I add in conclusion to my comments that in many parts of the country 
given that our research is in some ways limited, we believe that there's a very, very small number of Na NAMA units available in many parts of rural Ireland, many of which, thankfully, from an exchequer point of view, has already been sold off. But at this stage, I would ask my colleague Dermot Lacey to continue on. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Chairman. Uh, Dermot Lacey is my name from Dublin City Council. Chair, in deference to your uh, comment at the beginning that the uh, report has been circulated, I'll just comment uh, briefly. I won't go through the whole uh, submission. Uh, I suppose the bottom line that we would say, though, is that we need to build houses. You can have all the policies, all the strategies, uh, but there is simply a, a lack of homes and they need to be provided. And in order to deliver on some of the ambitious targets, there is a huge amount of funding required, and it's estimated that that's in the region of five and a half billion. Uh, and we recognise, and I recognise, that that will be a challenge for whoever is in government, but it's a challenge that quite simply has to be met. And uh, we welcome the recent comments by the House finance agency uh, and saying that they can lend at a fixed rate of 1.75% to local authorities for social housing pro projects. The agency has stated <coughs> that it has the capacity to deliver up to 10 billion and we believe that that uh, offer should be, should be uh, accepted. Uh, we recognise that there are EU issues but there is an emergency and government does have the freedom and the flexibility to uh, declare an emergency in relation to this issue. That's what they're, what's there. We also uh, support the proposals from the Irish Legal Credit Unions uh, that they say they will work with approved housing bodies uh, to deliver on additional housing units. And there is no conflict between uh, the provision of local authority housing and housing by the uh, approved housing bodies, uh, provided that their allocation system is done fairly and above board. But I suppose the point that primarily we, I would like to make in this part of submission, because I come in again later, is that we would like to see the whole area of procurement, tenderment, tendering and departmental, I can only say interference, uh, be addressed, because that is a key uh, blockage in tackling the housing uh, crisis. The length of time it takes to deliver social housing is unacceptable. Uh, the procurement process delays is unacceptable. And we have incident here, and I can give you further details, a particular housing scheme which I have followed, uh, in which uh, 19 housing units would be provided in the middle of uh, Donnybrook, and not just because I live there, but it's a high demand uh, social housing area. Uh, approval was given, full financial approval was given for that scheme in June of 2015. Uh, we should be at planning application stage last January, uh, and because of the tendering process, it hasn't even moved that forward. So a, a project to deliver 19 housing units in a high demand area, which will take 10 months to build, will actually be at least 36 months from the allocation of funding to people moving into it. And that's clearly unacceptable and it's due entirely to the requirement that every time the local authority makes a change, the department has to approve us, and every time the department makes a change, the council has to approve us. You know, we either employ professionals or we don't, uh, and the, the need to reduce the bureaucracy to allow a swifter tendering system is key to deliver social housing. It also, as one of my colleagues pointed out earlier, would have a profound impact on employment. Uh, the quicker we can get housing built, we not alone solve the housing issue, but we also give quality employment to people who need it. And Chair, I, I will be back later on, so I'm going to be brief in this occasion. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Chairman and members. Uh, in relation to the review of planning process, we recognise that delays can arise, particularly within the planning process for social housing projects. While acknowledging that all citizens have a right to get involved in the planning process, a balance has to be struck with the needs of those who require housing weighted more strongly in arriving at a planning decision. However, we do, as an association, have reservations in relation to the recent reports on proposed changes that the Minister is considering to the Part A planning process. Such reports suggest that the Minister is planning to introduce emergency legislation to enable city and county chiefs executives fast-track the planning process for social projects. It is understood that this would be through new rules reducing the consultation period from eight to four weeks. While 
While broadly we welcome the reform, we as an association would strongly object to any change to the reserve function of the elected members in relation to the Part 8 process. As previously stated, social housing projects need to be sustainable, integrated communities with accessibility to vital services for the benefit of the people who will live there. The elected members, by retaining the reserve function in Part 8 process, can ensure that all social housing projects are designed to ensure that these objectives is achieved. So, Chairman, while the association endorses movement <coughs> to streamline the planning system and the regulation requirements in relation to the provision of housing, neither are we saying that housing provision be so rushed as to promise compromise on the build and design standards. People who live in local authorities are entitled to the same standards of utility and design in their houses, as would be the case for a private house of a similar size. We have seen too many examples in this country of how rushed building programs have less lasting social problems. The proper planning of housing provision begins with consideration of location and ensuring, depending on the scale and nature of development, there is proper provision for of facilities such as schools, public transport, for them. <clears throat> Furthermore, the question on, on concentration needs to be considered. While it is tempting to react to a housing crisis by embarking on urgent building big schemes, the mistakes of previous mass provision of houses need not be repeated. There is plenty of expertise available in planning and architectural pr professions to make sure that housing can be built in a short time frame, while at the same time ob observing acceptable standards of location, design and build. The local knowledge of the county, the city council is, is an invaluable asset to ensuring the coordination provision of housing and the necessary support services. Thank you, Chairman. I'll hand you over now to Patrick. Uh, Chairman, uh, firstly, thank you, and committee members, thank you for allowing us the privilege of speaking before you today. Um, I want to deal with the need for recruitment and the appropriate technical staff to ensure the delivery of social housing projects. Due to the previous memorandum on our moratorium on recruitment in the public sector, local authorities have lost invaluable technical staff over the last number of years, and the loss of such experience is also leading to delays in the processing of some social housing projects. While, we, while acknowledging that this moratorium sorry, was lifted in 2015, local authorities are still experiencing difficulties in recruiting the appropriate technical staff needed to, <coughs> to progress some social housing projects because of the lack of the necessary funding. We would propose that the funding of the appropriate technical staff would be included in the capital costs of the housing projects to ensure no housing projects are delayed due to a lack of technical expertise. Short-term contracts to recruit appropriate technical staff should be afforded on specific social housing projects, if necessary, to ensure that these projects are commenced and delivered without delays. We would also propose that the same shared service model currently operating successfully in Irish local government environment should be employed to rapidly scale up the imp input of specialist housing personnel. Um, design and planning teams could be assembled in a number of core local authorities with their services available across country boundaries to other local authorities. This approach would use to good effect in the, was used to good effect in the early years of the National Motorway Programme, where a design team was assembled in a given county and its expertise deployed to other counties so as to create a flexible and a rapid response to the need for expertise in accelerating the building programme. I would also like to deal with the urban renewal and housing and there is strong correlation between the provision of housing and addressing of another major contemporary issue, that of the bringing of life back into centres of our towns and cities. Many towns have been hollowed or out with only small numbers of people living in the town centres. At the same time, there are often derelict or vacant sites located in or close to the town centre. While the freeing up of land in private ownership is a challenging issue, there would be nonetheless seem to be great potential for innovative infill provision 
of accommodation in local in locations where by definition are being served by public utilities. Schemes embracing various kinds of accommodation from one bedroom apartments to say three storey houses would help to make maximum use of inner urban land while at the same time bringing a sustainable population back into the town centres and locations. Uh, Chairman, I'd now like to hand over to my colleague, uh, Councillor Pat Daly. Thank you, Pat. And I'd like to thank the committee for meeting us. Uh, number seven is more student accommodation to relieve pressure on the rental market. In towns and cities areas close to third level colleges, the student demand can add greatly to the pressure on the availability of property to rent. The association would make the case for third level institutions to provide a much greater level of on campus <coughs> or near campus accommodation. This recommendation is grounded on the following factors. Helping to relieve pressure on the rented market in towns where there is third level accommodation. Helping relieve the cost of accommodation for students and their parents. Ensuring greater value for the higher education grants paid out by the state where currently the maintenance element of the grant is in many ways effectively a transfer of state funds to the private landlord. A number of third level colleges have considerable land within their campus perimeters. This land is well serviced by public utilities and public transport, <coughs> making it eminently suitable for the provision of student accommodation on site. There is a case that planning applications from third level colleges for expanding their academic infrastructure should be occupied by a statement showing how the relevant college proposes to address the accommodation needs of any increase in the student body. We note that Minister Coveney has already mentioned he would give considerable <coughs> consideration to promoting an accelerated provision of student accommodation and the association welcomes this in a way of freezing up property for wider tenant <coughs> requirements as well as the other advantages outlined. And I believe I've heard since that the National, the National Treasury Agency have proposed to make money available and this would relieve pre pressure if the colleges took it up. So number eight is uh, immediate need to deal with vacant local authority units provides. One issue that will help the immediate housing need is tackling the, <coughs> the issue of vacant local authority houses units or rides, and addressing the unacceptable relating times of up to 30 weeks in some instances. A recent report by the National Oversight and Audit Commission has concluded that the average relating times and costs vary considerably from 6 to 25 weeks, where major works were not required, with, with costs ranging from 9,000 to 23,000 per unit. The NOSC NOAC report also stated that a higher level of vacancies may be, in due, may be due, in some cases, to a local authority policy of holding vacancies in certain estates pending planned refurbishment works and, in other instances, to certain <coughs> housing stock not being popular with waiting list applicants. The NOAC report, which was based on 2014 data, <coughs> concluded that the reletting times for the date of previous tenant vacancies the dwelling to the date of the new tenant's first rent debit was a medium of 24 weeks. The AILG feels that it would be beneficial for individual local authorities to review their performances in this area and to ensure a timely turnaround of vacant units to meet the significant demand that exists for social housing. Having discussed this issue with our members and after having consultations with a number of local authority housing officers, we would call on the committee to propose in their final report that local authorities would have a dedicated ring fence rolling budget on an annual basis for pre-letting repairs costs. This rolling budget from Silton funds could be dependent on matching funding from the local authorities' own resources, which would help <coughs> with the timely reletting of vacant housing units. This would also give greater autonomy to each local authority to prioritise what level of repairs are required to bring their vacant units to relating standards, <coughs> taking their immediate housing needs into account. And just to comment that it is a slow process. 30 weeks isn't good enough. Someone has a, there's a house available in a local authority 
and the new, the new tenant has to wait 30 weeks to get that house. It's just not good enough. So, Dermot Lacey, number nine, please. Thanks, uh, Chair. We're going toward, towards the end. Um, the Association recognises and supports various measures that are being made by government uh, in relation to a number of issues. Uh, in particular, we acknowledge the money, the additional money for housing adaptations and extensions. So I will use this opportunity to point out a particular adaptation problem that primarily in former local authority houses and perhaps former Dublin City Council, Dublin Corporation houses in particular. Uh, tenants who wish to expand into their attics uh, and provide additional bedroom space for their families have a huge difficulty because the heights of the attics and their standard development don't fall under the building regulations requirement. They are perfectly suitable for bedroom conversions, but because of the department's regulations, they don't comply. So a very, very, very simple change uh, that could be made that would allow for decent quality bedrooms, uh, but they would be allowable bedrooms, would be for the department to reduce the required height of attic conversions, and I think it's roughly about uh, a foot and a half, I think, is the level. I don't have the exact figures here. Uh, we welcome the additional monies for the housing adaptions for older people. Some of the things we would like to see, Chair, is that uh, we would like to see the fairly immediate application of the changes to the Part 10 or Part 5 of the uh, Planning and Development Act so that the 10% at least start is in relation to social housing provision. We believe that there is a case for an affordable uh, housing provision similar to the last scheme. Uh, while affordability became less of a factor for some during the crash, it is becoming more and more of a factor in the future. Uh, we welcome the introduction of the vacant site levy, though perhaps it could be brought uh, forward. Uh, and we believe there is a major case for a levy on vacant houses. Uh, the figure that I think we heard from this committee of 230,000 empty housing is, quite honestly, a scandal. And even if it's only half of those figures, it's a scandal. Uh, and we believe that a vacant house levy may tackle that. Some of the other measures we would like to see that households in mortgage arrears and facing repossession should be able to transfer their homes into either a government agency or a local authority uh, where they could continue to pay the rent and live in the family home. Clearly, there is a need for greater provision of appropriate emergency accommodation and the provision of greater services in all parts of the country. Uh, it is not just an urban issue uh, for people with addiction and mental health supports. One, one final issue, uh, Chair, uh, and it affects the Rochdus members just as much as it affects local authority members, is that up to recently, councillors were issued with the housing allocation and transfer list by chief executives in their local authorities. Uh, in many local authorities, that has ceased to happen, and it ceased to happen apparently on the say so in the direction of the Data Protection Commissioner. What that has meant, well, some councillors in the past, and indeed some TDs in the past, abused that by uh, sending out letters telling people they were getting their houses before they even got them. My understanding is that in recent years, those lists were only allocate, issued after the allocation was done. But what it did mean was that councillors and indeed Oroctus members could stand over the integrity of the allocations and transfer list. Uh, in the manner in which they are issued now to councillors, uh, you cannot stand over the integrity of the allocation list. It also has a side effect, Chairperson, of uh, <coughs> councillors very often continuing to work for somebody to get a house who has already got the house, and the impact that it has on the local authority staff is a is sort of a downside. So we would ask that, in addition to the very big picture issues that you are looking at, that perhaps you might make recommendations that uh, councillors and Oroctus members could continue to get those lists. And thank you, and I hand you back to the President. Thank you, thank you very much indeed. And um, I would like to thank my five uh, colleagues on the Executive. And I'd like to introduce the uh, Council Louis McEntee, who is here with us as well, and our two directors, Tommy Myland and Liam Kinney. Now, just in conclusion, the Association of Irish Local Government endeavours to bring to the fore the voice of elected members who are rooted in their own community and see at first hand the toll that this housing crisis is, is having on the people that we represent. We acknowledge the work of this important committee, the pledge that we pledge that we will play our part on behalf of the elected members to address this housing and homeless crisis facing our people. 
In doing so, we would work alongside the committee and we look forward to continuing to contribute to the work of this committee. We would like to thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and the committee members for listening to our submission, and we would be glad to take um, questions now, and um, Parik and uh, Dermot and Michael, uh, we will answer whatever questions we, we, we can. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for uh, your, uh, I suppose, com uh, comprehensive statement. Just before I let colleagues, uh, I just want to put you in the picture. Um, Obviously, the committee has met many witnesses over the last number of weeks. Some of the issues that you, or many of the issues that you have raised, have been raised in other meetings, and members are quite familiar with them. Um, but the fact that you're attending today is quite important in terms of the schedule of our meetings, because many of the issues that you raise are actually very directly related to the local authorities themselves, the minister or the department. And we're having this meeting today in the context of, on Thursday, having the minister, the de new department, and uh, city and county manager. So it's in that context. So the recommendations and, that you're finding here, and in particular to uh, Councillor Lacey, you talked about the, the obvious delays in the whole process. That is, has been well flagged, and it is one of the issues that, you're right, we see as a block, and you know that's part of it. So your attendance here today is in that programme. Uh, so we thank you for the contributions. Uh, I have a number of people um, who have contributions, questions. Uh, I suppose I'd be slightly biased and let one of your former members in first, uh, Deputy Brophy. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Uh, yes, uh, and it is a privilege uh, to, uh, to welcome you here today as the person who was president of the association before John up until my election to the Dáil. Uh, it is great to see the association here and making the case strongly because I believe, as you've outlined yourself in your own submission, that obviously local councillors are really at the coalface when it comes to this issue. They're probably one of the most informed groups. And some of the questions which I wish to follow up on deal with that because I do think um, in that key position you hold uh, as elected local representatives uh, your knowledge in certain areas I think is critical and shouldn't be overlooked. So starting with that one of the areas I'm particularly interested, you alluded to it but I'd like a, a little further if you could enlarge on it. Um, the Section 8 proposals that the Minister has made in relation to rebalancing uh, the Section 8 and the input from the Chief Executive of the local authority versus the elected members. Um, I think you're, you make a very valid point in your, in your submission that they, it must be critical that the elected members must continue to be in control of a Part 8 process and they must continue to maintain uh, a level of control over it that enables them to reflect um, the people that live in the community, the people that elect local representatives, and uh, that their views still remain to be held as distinct from what's, let's be honest about this, is an unelected official uh, in, in a local authority. I'd be interested to hear some more on that. Um, I was pretty horrified to hear about the, 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 the void levels of up to 30 plus weeks that um, pa Pat alluded to. I mean, we've had a lot of feed into this committee earlier on with lower figures uh, than that. I know you mentioned to them. To my mind, there's, there, there's absolutely no point now in, um, in anybody being willing to accept 30 weeks or 30 weeks plus to turn around a void. It's beyond comprehension how, in the midst of a crisis, you can have a situation where local authorities are sitting on a void for 30 plus weeks. Uh, and not turning it round. Um, do you think there should be some type of? You talked about incentives to enable them to do it, but there should be some. Should there be some type of penalty situation there if people are not failing, uh, are failing to deliver turnarounds in line with what is becoming a much lower national average um, uh, figure? Um, the uh, the design team point you make I think is quite interesting. Um, you know that you could have a design team which would be able to move on a cross county level. I mean certainly within the context of the the greater Dublin uh, authorities, there's there's little or no logic why you wouldn't be able to have a design team working for South Dublin. You know delivering as well for Dunleary, delivering for Fingal, etc. So I think it's a very it's a very well made point um, on that, uh, and I, I I think that's something that's a very positive. Um, um, point you make in your submission. Um, the, the, I suppose really the, the other thing that I would particularly just um, 
just look for a more bit, bit of information on how would you envisage technical staff being incorporated into the capital cost of a project? How would that actually um, how, how would that actually work? And, and conclusion, just to, to echo your point on third level uh, student accommodation, I, I'd go even further than what you said. I believe at this point we're reaching a point where third level colleges should not be able to expand their student capacity numbers without absolutely having to provide the increase in accommodation to meet that because effectively every single time that that happens you're putting an extra strain on the existing supply of housing so but uh, thank you very much for a very interesting submission deputy, i'll take a number of contributions and i'll come back to you in that uh, deputy butler and i'd also remind colleagues of the timing we have two more sessions this afternoon deputy butler uh, thank you Cahir Luck. and i would also like to welcome the members of the eilg here today um, i have to say i found your work very worthwhile when i became a new councillor two years ago and i i, I certainly enjoyed attending your um training conferences I, 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 I would just like to say, to put it on the record, I, I found it very worthwhile. Um, I agree with most of your comments that, 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 that you said there, and I would also like to say, when I was a councillor and even as a TD now, I'd say 80% of all my reps are housing and homeless um, based, and I think that's, that's uh, a nationwide problem. Um, just uh, to keep it brief, I have a few questions there. Um, and I think I know the answer to this already because you, you spoke about um, converting attics. Do the AILG see the merit in extending the current stock of local authority houses to facilitate tenants with overcrowding as applying for a transfer is not feasible anymore because you're waiting too long? And I think it could be a short-term solution to put maybe um, a bedroom and a bathroom on for maybe 30 or 40,000 and it would certainly make a difference. The second question is, do you find that the HAP scheme is not working to its full capacity and needs to be amended to encourage landlords to take on HAP tenants? Uh, thirdly, and you touched on this briefly, NAM offered, uh, we had NAM in here and they offered 6,500 units to the local authorities all over the country. Now, um, the take-up was only 2,500 units, so that meant there was 4,000 units that were not taken up on. I think actually Galway was the only county, um, was the only local authority that actually took their full um, their full allocation. Just your thoughts on that, please. Um, in relation to traveller accommodation, do you accept that some councils are very slow or reluctant to draw down the finances available to them, and just, there's a perception out there that, that, that there's just not the political will um, within the local authorities to deal with these issues? Uh, thank you very much. Theo Brent. Thank you, um, Chair, and, and thanks, uh, members, for the, the presentation. I suppose, like a lot of us that are former councillors, we both share the frustration that your presentation has outlined, uh, as well as your belief that local authorities are best placed to kind of deliver the increase in social housing that's needed. Just a couple of questions, and some of the questions aren't necessarily my view, but they're the views of other people who I disagree with, but I'd be interested in having your response to them put on the record for our own work. Minister Coveney is talking about reducing the Part 8 period from eight weeks to four weeks. That's one of the ideas he's actively considering. Now, there are some local authorities that get through their Part 8s within about eight weeks. There are some it takes 17 weeks. There are some it takes nine months in one particular local authority. But I just, I suppose, what's your view, first of all, on the Minister's proposal, and also where there are local authorities that are taking excessively long lengths of time to get through Part 8s? Do you have counter proposals to that of the Minister to ensure that the Part 8 process doesn't become part of the additional delay, uh, um, particularly in the context of if there is more money for social housing, how do we make sure the councils uh, get through their bit of the procedure as well? Uh, on the voids, I suppose I come from South Dublin County Council, like Deputy Brophy, and the choice based letting system has really helped South Dublin County Council to reduce the, the voids just in terms of the turnaround. Is that something your association has thought of advocating to be rolled across all local authorities? Because, again, our experience would be uh, that that does help enormously. Um, on the rapid builds, um, again, the Minister is talking about doubling the number of rapid builds um, uh, and using the same emergency powers. Do you have a view of that? Uh, and if so, can you share it with the, the committee? My last question is this. If we have a significant increase in capital available to local authorities to provide units, uh, and many of us in this room strongly believe that should be the case, we are going to run up against a problem of government policy, which is the sustainable communities uh, that a number of you have mentioned, because it will require us to start building on a scale beyond the small infill schemes that many local authorities have been doing until now. 
I have my own ideas about how to, to deal with that, which I'll raise at committee when we deal with this at a later stage. But I'm just interested in your view, at the point at which your local authorities get substantially more money, how are you going to deliver those units beyond 10% part five or small infill schemes of 10, 15 or 20 units? Uh, and how do you think we can meet the sustainable communities in the context of large scale local authority build and buy, um, which hasn't happened since those sustainable community policies were introduced? Thanks, Chair. Uh, I have a number of other colleagues uh, indicated, but if you'd like to address some of those issues first. Uh... Thank you, Chair. I just said to one on Part 8. Yeah. Okay. Uh, on the Part 8 one, in the, re in the review of planning, I suppose we're, we've reached, it's always good to review things and to reform things. We need to look at things from time to time. Uh, and coming from a local authority in Limerick, where planning has been a huge issue down through the years, where we had 40% of our residents on social housing in the old city council. So planning was a huge issue for us. Now, I totally agree with the Minister, like, you know, this it is a time of crisis, and we must fast forward as far as possible our, our planning process. But I do believe, actually, Part 8, is, as it stands today, is a fast-track system if we use it well. And I think, my, I honestly believe myself, to take the council, to take the council out of it, you're actually taking the community out of the planning issue because the council does represent the community at the local authority. And if, if, his, if his influence is diluted in any shape or form, you know, I think that's a very serious matter. Because we must make sure that any development that goes forward is appropriate to the area it's going into. And we had a very good report in Limerick actually from John Fitzgerald, the former Dublin city manager. And he wrote a wonderful report. I, I won't say the mistakes, because at the time people made, made their judgments in, in the best interest of the city. But in hindsight, we made huge mistakes because our planning was we put all social housing in together with any infrastructure going in. None of the educational facilities, none, none of the, the, the health systems, none of the transport system, none of the childcare system. There were so many things that we didn't do at the time. And we suffer severely forward. So while I welcome the Minister and his intention in a time of crisis to fast forward as far as possible, but in doing that, I think the role of the councillor you know, is hugely important because we are the people actually who meet the people who have elected us at the call face. We go to the residents' association, we go into the community centres, we are in touch with them on a daily basis, Chairman. So like we do know what concerns them. And you know, putting large numbers of housing in, in, into an existing social housing area or even to a private for the states. You know, there are major concerns there. So I do think the party, while I welcome the Minister's intention to fast forward the in a climate crisis, I do think he should look at it very carefully and measure it. Why, what will the role of the Council be in any new setup going forward? Thank you. Uh, very briefly, uh, Deputy Butler, of course, housing adaptions have a role to play and there should be more flexibility there. Uh, on, on NAMA, I mean, let's be clear, no councillor, as I understand, around the country, across the country, rejected any housing allocation or offering by NAMA because, of course, under our dysfunctional local government system, councillors don't have a role in that. So the decisions were made by the unelected uh, chief executives, talking to the unelected NAMA people, talking to the unelected officials in the customs house. If you want to change that, you'd have my support hugely. Uh, in relation to uh, Deputy, Deputy O'Brien's comments, I mean, in relation to Part 8, it's a question of we want swift decision but accountable decision, and they're not incompatible. And on the last point, I support rapid build as a ne necessary, <coughs> but I won't take any lectures from either the Minister or the Department about our tardiness in relation to Part 8. I mean, really, in all honesty, the Department had some cheek accusing local councillors of delaying any process given its fairly shameful record over the last 20 years. Yeah, um, just a couple of things and brief comments on some of the subjects that's already raised. Again, in the, in the overall scheme of things on the Part 8, whether it be eight or four weeks, I believe it's relatively immaterial. Uh, the one thing that we have to be careful about is that whether our genuine concerns raised by existing tenants or otherwise, that just for the sake of getting th things speeded up, that they're not in any way overlooked, because there are genuine concerns held in some cases. The rapid bills, listen, I think it's, there's a bit of an urban-rural divide there, and again, I think I'd be guided by our city colleagues and our big town colleagues. I'm not a fan. There's nothing to stop a proper house being built inside of six months if everything was ready on the ground. Uh, I, I'm not a fan. I think five years down the road we'll wonder what we'll do with them and we will have 
spent a lot of money on them, given that there are only a short-term term solution. Uh, Deputy Butler talked about 80% reps. You know, given, and I know you're probably extensively urban-based to some extent in terms of your, your clinics, Listen, I don't believe you'll ever find a solution where that can all be solved in such uh, an area. I believe, and I know Dermot mentioned this earlier when we were talking, the whole area of idea of relocation should be reintroduced because I do believe there are people in, in cities that would look at moving out of cities and it's something that has kind of went off the, the, the agenda slightly and as I say, given the crisis that there is in places like Dublin, I, I don't think it's feasible to expect in any sort of a short term that that can be solved. The NAMA units, listen, sadly, maybe many of the 4,000 LAMA units that hasn't been taken up, you'll find that a lot of them are built in the wrong places in terms of the, the daily requirements. And listen, many of them are the mistakes of bad planning and rushed planning over the, the, the 10 years of madness that we all seen. And can I just say, and I know Deputy O'Brien makes a good points in relation to the voids. You know, I think the void situation, I understand as we sit here, that there is a variation from at any given time, county from one county to another. In some cases, it's as low as 2%, in others, it's as high as 18 At any given time, there's either 2% of their houses stock empty or as high as 18 I think all you need to do is see what the 2% is doing and tell those that have a disgraceful level of 18 Use best practice, share back best practice. And the last thing in relation to putting design teams in place and moving them around, you know, We've done it very successfully with the whole roads, and indeed the question was asked in terms of the technical cost, where, who pays the technical staff. Well, I know when we were building national roads, the county that the road was going through, it was their engineers that oversaw the project on the ground. Um, they got paid uh, indirectly or directly from the NRA, now the TII. There's nothing to say that that model can't be just transferred over to housing. And, you know, housing is a much easier science in that they don't need to move as round as much. Building a housing scheme, whether it be in Dublin or Cork, when you have your site ready, it doesn't really matter. It's the, it's the design of the houses and how they're constructed. Building a road is slightly more complex, and I can see a need what they have to move. But, you know, these design teams, it's, a lot of it is desktop and could be acted in that part. But the voids is unacceptably high in some cases. Uh, those counties deserve to be congratulated on others, but just share uh, best practice. Uh, just before uh, Pat Daly comes in, as regards the LAMA, I suppose there is, there is counties that, that, that have no uh, LAMA houses in them, and that is a, a big problem. Maybe if, the, if there was um, land blacks, banks or something like that, they could be taken up. But Pat Daly would just like to make a comment before... Just on Deputy Butler there, I think that the HAP schemes, you know, the assistance to payment, I'll give an average rent around County Clare, it's about €650 Euros a month, possibly 1200 around Dublin, I imagine. But um, the average payment out is about 400 and it's not enough because these people are on social welfare and they're getting about 400 and their shortfall is €70 Euros a week. And I think that the Minister for Housing, I believe, Simon Coveney, should get a bigger budget and increase the HAP assistance. It's just not high enough at the moment. And on a regular basis, councillors are meeting people every day and they're on HAP schemes and they just can't pay it. <coughs> Um, the traveller accommodation. I'll come back to it. Yeah, I'll, yeah. You, can, might, you might comment on that. I have mm. a couple of others here. Deputy Ryan. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. I'd like to thank the Association for coming in and helping us with our work. Um, I suppose, look, as a, this committee wouldn't be in existence at all of the, the fact that there's a housing supply issue, and really what we're trying to address as a committee in, a, in as quick a way as we can is to how do we deliver quickly, you know, in the kind of a year to 18 months that people will be waiting where the, the existing strategy comes into play uh, we're in that lag phase so in terms of um, measures to deliver quickly in those kind of areas obviously rapid build was, uh, comes into play as well but in terms of local opposition uh, that generally does arise uh, in relation to uh, social housing or can arise in, social, in relation to social housing have you, have you as an organisation kind of talked about that and the part uh, that councillors might play in that in terms of, uh, you know, 
trying to uh, hold off that opposition and recognising there is a, a role to be played by yourselves uh, and the community general in terms of delivering against uh, on this problem. Well, like, Keep going though, yeah. Okay, I have a mic, yeah. Okay. <laughs> In terms of the voids, the voids issue, one element of the voids that kind of um, occurred to me over the years is, look, why do local authorities allow the voids to, to build up over time, and why was it necessary for them to wait for special funding to deal with, with voids? I would have thought, as part of the budgetary process that you guys are involved in, that one of the things you've got to address on an annual basis would be to repair your housing stock. Um, so it seemed to me that it was something that was left behind over time and then uh, it, it became such a critical measure that uh, central funding was, uh, was needed for that. So there are my two areas. The other questions were asked. Thank you, Deputy Ryan. And concluding, Deputy Cowan. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks to the, to the members for bringing forward their suggestions and solutions. And just two questions in its relation to um, funding. The cap on uh, discretion for local authorities in relation to capital expenditure. Um, do you agree it should be raised? Do you agree there should be greater discretion for local authorities rather than seeking the approval at all times for uh, the department, which is one of the great delays that exist? And also in relation to voids, again, there's a cap of 30,000 on um, repair and reinstatement of void units. Which, um, you know, do you believe too that local authorities should have greater discretion? and a higher amount in order to address those issues much uh, quicker than is the case considering the sort of time scale you've mentioned to us, which is not surprising to us at all, despite what Deputy Brophy has said, this is something that has been quite obvious. Um, I know there's been some inroads in recent times, but it's been very obvious for the last two years. Thank you. That concludes the questions from this side. In reply, also, Bear, Deputy Durkin. Briefly. Yes, very please. quickly, uh, as always, Chairman. Uh, I, I want to, to uh, say to our colleagues, you're, you're very welcome here because you speak the language that, uh, that uh, we know you uh, have gleaned from your own direct dealings uh, with the people who are in, in need of housing in the local authorities. And that's uh, obviously uh, very refreshing and, um, and important. And mind you, many of the other delegations had, uh, were speaking similarly. Can I ask in relation to, the, to planning, to what, to, to what do you think might be done to speed up the planning process in relation to part five, in relation to preparation for local authority housing, in relation to anything that uh, contributes to the immediate uh, um, contribution to the supply of local authorities housing. Could I ask also the, the, to what extent uh, you have considered the uh, reintroduction of local authority loans, what we used to call the country council loan, which was a, a, a primary part of the, of the system for first time house buyers, uh, no longer unfortunately being, being, uh, being used or available, worthwhile. And in relation to the voids, what has been the, the, the problem in relation to the voids? Why, for instance, I hope, and this is an experience that we've all had, Mr. Chairman, uh, it, 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 it used to happen that uh, in the event of a house becoming vacant, any improvements to the house carried out by the previous tenants, some of them which were very extensive, were immediately thrashed and thrown in the bin, and, and, and the house reconstructed afterwards. The, the, the theory being that if there was an oak kitchen and oak tables and that kind of thing, that the tenant might expect to have them replaced if they were needed replacement at a later stage. So the, the idea was uh, uh, to, to replace them beforehand, at considerable cost, needless to say, and people were in the position of fishing out of the waste bins some of the old materials that were being discarded. To what extent has that been uh, discontinued to your satisfaction? And the last one is in relation to modular ho homes and houses. How do you uh, <coughs> address the issue of the urgency of the situation we're faced with now? What, what, what proposals, uh, for instance, do you think can be helpful to you in the meeting the urgent homelessness issue and the ever-increasing threats of homelessness uh, arising from a whole series of issues that, we, that I don't particularly want to go into? Deputy. Uh, councillors, a range of issues, and you might also respond to the previous uh, issue in relation to traveller accommodation by Deputy Butler. Uh, like very, very briefly, uh, Chair. Uh, first of all, uh, Deputy Ryan, I, I fully agree with you in relation to leadership. 
But that's an issue that's often thrown at councillors by Oireachtas members. And I think it has to be borne in mind that Oireachtas members have uh, shorn local councillors of powers over the last 15 years. And, you know, whenever powers are transferred to us to, in relation to difficult issues, uh, I'll take a stand on tough issues, but I would like councillors to be given back some of the nicer powers that have been so taken from us over the last 15 years. And the same partially applies to Deputy Cowan's comment. I mean, it's all very well saying that local authorities should do all these things. But, you know, and I'm not trying to make some third party point here, local government funding has been absolutely decimated over the last 20 years. We don't have the funds to do the sort of things that we used to do in the past. I mean, I did a calculation recently that if domestic rates still applied in Dublin, a city, we would get 220 million, uh, we get 63 million in, under local property tax. You know, that's just one year alone on that one figure, you know, a gap of 160 million. So it's all very well called and let's do these things, but give us the power and give us the resources to do so. On, on the voids, you know, again the financing comes in, but Deputy Durkin has sort of answered this question. One of the problems is that we don't have direct labour anymore. So we send, we want a job done, we have to go out to tender. We used to have painters and plumbers and electricians who could go out and do the job. We don't have those anymore because of cutbacks. And the second issue is the issue that Deputy Durkin has raised. We have to apply departmental standards. So despite the fact that the flat is absolutely perfect, that the people who want to move into it love the way the previous tenant has it, would move in tomorrow morning. The department, because of our centralised system of government, says that apartment has to have a grey door, it has to have a kitchen in that corner, it has to have a door that way. If we had the flexibility to allow people to live the lives they want to live, we could do turnarounds in days rather than months. Yeah. Just touching on a few, I suppose the travellers is an age-old problem and indeed I was taken aback to read the number of local authorities that didn't take up any allocation and listen, probably my own is one of those. We don't have a particular problem, um, we, we actually have a number of halting sites and the new trend is that these travellers don't want to go into halting sites. We equally have a very small number of uh, travellers housed permanent housing and I have to say the quality of the housing after a few years leaves a lot to be desired both inside and out and you can understand why there is concern but I have people happily living alongside them but they are constantly reminding the council to educate them as to what's expected of them as to how to keep their house if they're going to be in the middle of everybody else and I have to say other than in some cases the appearance of the accommodation I don't have very many complaints about them in general in the way they live. They do have uh, traditions that we don't necessarily uh, understand fully but listen I do believe every local authority could do more in relation to travelling and I think we as an organisation would promote a greater, a greater uptake in that whole funding area. I think Brendan, Deputy Ryan mentioned about how would we propose to speed up houses within 12 or 18 months. Well I, I believe one solution to this is I am tirelessly listening to people saying past developers and present developers they cannot make money even as of now by building houses. I do believe we should negotiate with them, agree a set fee for them to provide houses to our standards on their land. I believe there's, there's a lot of projects more or less shovel ready. Um, and no matter what we say, and I suppose we're speaking against ourselves to some extent, the private sector can deliver quicker than the public. That's the reality. Because councillors, while they want to come to hold the, the, the function of where and when they provide houses if money is given, but they are there uh, as the buffer between the public and the, 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 the schemes in many cases. But private developers can. Uh, I believe move faster, both f uh, physically and indeed theoretically in terms of contracts. I for interrupt you. This is the important point. Can that be done on contract from the public sector? Well, I have no doubt it, it should be. Now, maybe there is a need for legislative changes, but I believe that's an obvious one. And I would guarantee a big uptake on this because there are, the private developers see no great light at the end of the tunnel. Now, they may have paid over the odds for the land, but I do believe a lot of them. It would provide them with employment and it would give them a need for the land that they're sitting on now for 10 and 12 years. So I think that's an area that could be looked at. Um, 
VIDs, everybody mentioned VIDs. The one reason I think there are so many VIDs, and as I say, I come from a county which I think is the 2% or among those on 2%, so it's not a big issue for us, but a lot of those that it is an issue will blame the lack of finance. The roads and VIDs were the two areas hit. Everything else had to be paid for. These are two things that can be put on the back burner, and that's what happened to a, to a disgraceful extent. And the last comment I'll make in relation to speed up the process, of those schemes that need to go near Board Penala, something than has to be done with Board Panala. Board Panala were quicker in turning around decisions during the boom than they are today. And that is unacceptable. 12 and 18 months, and every time you do get a, a, a date for a decision, inevitably you'll get another letter to say it has been delayed for two months. Something has to be done this. I mentioned this in person to the Minister last week when we met him. Board Panala has to be looked at and examined, not with a view to change in how it does it, but at the speed in which it does it. Michael Howard again. Just quick, on, on, uh, you were saying, uh, Deputy, on the, can we speed up the Part 8? Like, I do believe myself that in our local authorities now, because of the embargo on staff, there's a serious lack of technical people, architects, engineers, also admin staff. And in relation to acquisition of houses, I know myself it's not a problem of money in actual fact, in where I come from. It's a problem of availability of houses. People are very slow. They don't, they want to, and, it, and I'll also say, in relation to landlords, I think landlords now are, are over-regulated in actual fact. I, I think there's too much stuff, there's, they're over regulated and people are, are getting out of it. And if you want to get the, the, the construction industry back into the steam, I honestly believe we must give them tax breaks. There has to be an incentive. These people are in business to make, to make a profit. And unless you give them a tax break, I'll give them some real incentive to, to do the work. I don't think they're going to come back in. Uh, and the same for the landlord, unless he is a, an incentive to let out his house. But now he's over regulated. There's so many regulations around a tenancy now that people are just pulling out of the business. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, yeah, just on there um, uh, about the turnaround of the houses and taking uh, and, and throwing out like good valuable materials. I think if where people want to move into a house, they should be allowed to move into a house and turn them around very very quickly, and not to see houses sitting there for you know 30 weeks and uh, you know you're passing by and you're seeing lovely doors and windows and everything, but they're not the right colour and suddenly because they have to change all that. That should all be stopped. That's waste, willful waste makes woeful want, and we have a woeful want for housing in this uh, country at this moment for people uh, and uh, certainly uh, deputy. The other thing there's a housing financing agency they're sitting on a load, a load of money they're sitting on an excess of 10 billion uh, and you know they should be made make uh, money freeable and it should be used to, to uh, take up and build some of the social housing that's needed. So that's, again, Chairman, I think they're uh, very important that we see a reaction and action. It's a reaction to this crisis and action from the developers, from everyone, that's because we've all uh, skin in this game, Chairman. Just a, a final one on, on, on homelessness. And I think that finance should be made available to, to, to purchase a small units and uh, probably hostels. And it's a serious situation in every county in this country particularly in Dublin, and it's, it's something that we should be looking at. And just on the, the, the budgets, I think Deputy Council are there. We get onto the CEO at every monthly meeting. I have no money. That's all we hear. And the abolishment of town councils, I'll give you an example in Ennis, where there was 30,000 people living, and we had huge budgets in town council. That is all gone now. So our budgets are down, way down. Just one line, our chairman, if I may, yes. uh, and I just want to mention on Vides, uh, I have seen some beautiful houses that were handed back in immaculate condition, and they were torn asunder because they had to bring them up to the stand. I think that's one of the first things that will have to be sorted out, because it's costing the exchequer thousands and thousands, and we wouldn't be looking at, at, the, at the dates that we have to uh, be waiting for the turn out as well. So uh, the reconstruction grants, I think, uh, which like in the 1980s, uh, t you know, that you can get your house back, etc., etc., I think should be brought in as well. Thank, thank you very much. At this stage, just, just before, we, before we conclude this session, I'd like to thank uh, the councillors for their attendance here today to remind you that uh, apart from the submission and the questions, this feeds into the questions we'll be asking both of the Minister and the Department. And some of them are very, like the issue of the voids, the issue of the, the process 
uh, the duration of the process um, from, I suppose, start to finish in terms of a housing development, the length of time, the number of, uh, I suppose, visits between the local authority and the department, those are issues that we'll be pursuing because it has been raised with us time and time again that they are delaying the actual delivery more than probably any other single item. So thank you very much for your attendance today. We'll suspend for a couple of moments until we have our next witnesses in. Thank you.